And now, live from the uh, Imperial Rooms Mayfair, <laughs> it's Busman and Quantic Kingside! <laughs> And Quantic King Size. I'm Jane Busman. I'm David Quantic. Hello! And now, five things you never knew about Melvin Bragg. One, he's on the telly. <laughs> Two, he's got a really deep bath. And three, he's married to Busman and Quantic King Size's own Steve Brody. That's a filthy lie. Then how do you explain this? Dear Melvin, Please take your bags, cases and teddies from my house and leave forthwith. I am now well aware that you only married me to stay in the country. Signed, Steve Brody. So it was a fan letter. P.S. You were the original Mr. Lover Man, but I can no longer share you with Ike Turner? High in the bleak Canadian mountains, where the unyielding snow lies thick on the fir trees, lives a pack of wolves. Gather round me, my wolves. I have grave news. My senses tell me there is danger. Are the bright lights coming down the strange black path? Is the big metal bird going to fall from the sky? What metal bird? Up there, next to the jumbo jet. (laughs) No, the forest is going to close. It's no longer making a profit. (gasps) We've been made redundant. Oh, no. I've lost my pride. I've lost my self-esteem. I've lost my confidence. I've lost my pride. I've lost my self-esteem. I've lost my confidence. And I've gone impotent. (laughs) Tell us, wise wolf, what should we do? Gather round. We must listen to our ancient wolf spirit. The answer is within us. Tell us what What is it? What is it? What is it? We must form a wolf strip act. Meanwhile, in a steel mill in the north of England. Bad news, lads. We've been laid off. Oh, no. What are we going to do? <laughs> We're going to hunt in packs and kill reindeer. Smart! <laughs> oh, no. Miss, tenderise me wee ramp with a meat hammer. Use a Brillo pad on me, sir. I'm a dirty boy. I am a dirty boy. <laughs> Right on me in biro, only a tanner. Give us fruppens and fondle the balls of me feet, I'm a Get. dirty boy. Get out. Poke me in a soft place. Slip me, badly, I'm a dirty boy. Out! <laughs> they were two souls, bound together through love, yet kept apart by society's convention. Their love could never be, and yet it was, because they were... Rabbis in love. (laughs) Tuesday. Do you remember when I playfully knocked your hat off and we chased it through the park and then, when a dog ran off with it, we collapsed under the tree, panting like maddened billy goats, fanning each other with my remaining hat. Your strong chest rose and fell, your nostrils flared, and your beard waved magnificently like thick black corn in a field of chin. (laughs) Later, I held you up as you were sick in a waste bin. (laughs) On the way home, arms around each other, we pointed in shop windows and laughed at the goods. How funny to think that we both hate cooked meats. I must see you again. Yours, etc., Rabbi Esterhaas. Excuse me, I'm looking for the MC Escher exhibition. The what? MC Escher. MC Escher, Dave, you did those never-ending spiral staircase pictures. Oh, yes, go left, up the steps, turn left, can't miss it. Ta. Doctor, there's something wrong with the vicar. Don't be silly, nurse. He's sponging his aspidistra. Not going at himself like Popeye in solitary confinement with one hand tied behind his back. (laughs) I am what I am. (laughs) Oh, I received your letter, my friend. And it went through me like my housekeeper's tapioca. (laughs) I keep it inside my lower trousers, and I can hear it rustle as I fold my pants. 
When I go to work, I fold it into a packet to keep my clipping scissors in. I wish, I wish, I wish you could visit, but how could I explain the presence of another rabbi in my house? Sometimes I dream that you are, but then my housekeeper comes in and I have to pretend that you're a personal fitness trainer. <laughs> Yours, etc., Rabbi Templeman. P.S. As I write this, I am brushing my hat. <laughs> Lives of the Early Christian Martyrs Number 1 St. Amius and St. Dominic St. Amius? Yes, St. Dominic Make us a cup of tea oh. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm looking for the M.C. Asher exhibition The what, which? M.C. Asher Oh yes, go left, up the steps, turn left, can't miss it Ta <laughs> And now they was the chiefs of writing. Then they died. EasyJet presents the Bronte story. <laughs> and thus they lived happy ever after. Finish, Father. I, Emily Bronte. I shall call my book Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights? You might as well call it I Am Gay. <laughs> It. Newspapers? Bah! There's no such thing. Father, we must think of Sister Anne and her tickly cough. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, Anne, Father, I have news of an investment that shall make kings of us all. Charlotte, why are you dressed in a sailor's garb, sister? Have you been press scanned into the Navy? No, I, uh, bum. I like sailors. <laughs> Who doesn't? Emily! Can you bring me a lot of money to the docks by nightfall? For only 5,000 guineas, we can invest in the world's first hover horse. A hover horse? Ho oh, ho, excellent idea. The old horses were bumpy as anything. Come on, Emily, give us five grand. I don't know. Anne, what do you think? <laughs> Brother Bramwell? <laughs> A woman that had a hover horse would be irresistible to men. <laughs> there, the hover horse is built. <laughs> now to launch it onto the lake. It seems to be sinking. It'll come back up in a minute. Oh, we're skint. We shall never leave this place. Have no fear. I shall write a book, and I will call it Live and Let Die. New from BBC Worldwide, a classic cassette devoted to radio's greatest cock-ups. 68 years of slight radio errors. Radio's greatest cock-ups. Hello and welcome to Woman's Hour. I hope you all die, you f***s. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll read that again. Over 20 minutes of no holds barred mayhem. It's the best radio's greatest cock-ups cassette ever. Jesus Christ, get off me, you horrible fat witch! Wah! And that concludes the shipping forecast. <laughs> Both your favourites are here. Now, that's what I call radio's greatest cock-ups. Also available on 8-track cartridge, 7-inch single and mini dick. Uh, disc. Oh, flaming p***. <laughs> and now, part nine of the Ike Turner and Melvin Bragg story. I, Melvin. I'm very pleased to receive this BAFTA for lifetime services to the arts. I feel that the arts in this country are underfunded, underrepresented, and... Uh, there you are, hair boy! <laughs> what you doing all dressed up? You cheating on Big Ike? No, now, Ike, I'm getting a BAFTA. Who are all these people? These are members of the British Association of Film and Television Academy. Well, now they're members of the British Academy of People Who Crossed Ike Turner. <laughs> Melvin Bragg, you belong to me. 
No, Ike, don't use your heat. Nobody mess with Ike Turner. I'm gonna firebomb the whole building. No, Ike. You don't know him like I do. He's, he's very deep. He's into numerology. <laughs> steamy windows. Steamy windows. Shut up, after boy! <laughs> And now on Anglia, it's time for Puritan Vet. Last week, <laughs> last week, the Puritan Vet filled a puppy's mouth with concrete for barking on a Sunday. <laughs> Puritan Vet. Meow! I'm so glad you could see my Fifi veterinary. I've been that worried. Six month pregnant and not a kitty. Leave your cat with me, Mrs. Old. Meow. Pregnant, are we? Litter, is it? Jezebel! Tart! Cat whore! Out into the snow! Meow. Right. What's next, Miss Yorkthorpe? Old Mr. Rawls brought in his rabbit. He says it's a bit playful. Aha! Gambling. <laughs> Just a bit frisky. Scrub up the gambling rabbit. No more Ludo for Flopsy. <laughs> Lives of the Early Christian Martyrs, number two. Saint Nicodemus of Elsion and Saint Elias of Tours. Saint Nicodemus? Yes, Saint Elias. Change the channels. I can't find the remote. <laughs> oh. Catalogue of the Extinct, Volume 6. Nesmith's Farting Amoeba. <laughs> Where is it? Here. Yeah. Let me just adjust the microscope. I... I still can't see it. <laughs> oh, ah, good yeah, show. Yes, there it is. <laughs> Quick! Here comes Lord Bouncy, the helium-filled peer. <laughs> Children! Hello, Tricked by a lady spy, Countess Voluptua von Hun, Bouncy has been taken prisoner. The idiot inflatable has been locked up with 400 countrymen in Stalag 99 Luftballons. Will he ever see Bouncy Castle again? But the distended despot kept standards high in the camp with constant games of cricket. Although utterly futile and depressing, these games drew attention away from the three-mile tunnel Bouncy had dug under a napkin. <laughs> After exhausting labor, Bouncy completed the tunnel and managed to smuggle all 400 POWs into his dorm and into the tunnel. They outwitted the guards. <gasps> Crept past savage Dobums. Only the barbed wire fence remained. <laughs> oh. Come on, one cheer for Lord Bouncy. Hooray. Hooray. Excuse me, I'm looking for the MC Asher exhibition. The what? MC Asher. Oh, yes, go out, turn left, up the steps, can't miss it. Ta. <laughs> Sorry. I'm proud to say that for several years now, without flagging for a single day, I've been depressed. I hate myself so much I'd like myself to move out But I need myself there to pay the rent <laughs> Five signs you're depressed One, you feel jealous of cartoon characters Because they've got good bodies <laughs> You think you know what's in Judy Finnegan's head <laughs> You've eaten so much Ben and Jerry's You have to put salt on it to make it taste of anything <laughs> By your standards, the English patient is a comedy and you take ages leaving the newsagent in the hope they'll ask you what's wrong. <laughs> they don't. So you go home with another no fun size Mars bar. <laughs> Depression makes everything personal. You make a cup of coffee. The coffee's brown. That's typical. <laughs> the bathroom is the only clean room in the house. And that's because you stop washing. 
In the old days, you could tell someone who was unsound because they had string holding their trousers up. <laughs> now you have tracksuit bottoms, the uniform of the depressed. Sports tramp. When you're depressed, you can only get rubbish jobs. Walking people's dogs. Here, boy. No, sod off, you're bringing me down. You earn ten quid and you spend it on a new dog that looks like the old one a bit. You could have the best job in the world, an explorer discovering that village in the Himalayas. I'd be, are we nearly there yet? <laughs> Apparently, at the point of death, your life flashes before you. I'm hoping it'll be someone else's. <laughs> but cheer up. Here are two reasons not to top yourself. One, it won't work. <laughs> you wake up with a perforated liver feeling a right git. And two, it might work. Then you'd be sorry. <laughs> And now in a change to our published programme, which has been cancelled as its title rhymed with something that happened in the news this week, <laughs> it's Puritan Vet. Last week, the Puritan Vet walled up a hamster in its own cage because it might have been hoarding nuts in its cheeks. <laughs> Puritan Vet. Right, Mrs Teasdale, I've just got to sew up your budgie's eyes for looking at you in the dunny, then I'm finished. Excuse I, Mr. Veterinary. What? Oh, oh, it's you, Farmer Thwaitmore. Is your cow Daisy dead yet? I'm right sorry, Mr. Veterinary, but this morning I went down to the cow shed expecting to see our Daisy all sick and ill, but she's taking an upward turn. Look. <laughs> our Daisy's made a natural recovery. Dart not needed. Natural recovery, my eye. That cow's a witch! <laughs> <laughs> Lives of the Early Christian Martyrs, number three. Saint Robert de Courcy of Alsace-Lorraine and Saint Thomas de Lyon of bligny sur rhone <coughs> Saint Robert? <sighs> yes, Saint Thomas? Get up and turn the light off. <sighs> <laughs> and now, in association with the Midland Bank and Sinn Féin, it's the Bronte story! And they lived happily ever after by Emily Bronte, me. Finish, father. I shall call it Shirley. Shirley? That's a girl's name. Where's my fags? We shall definitely have money to leave this unhealthy lodging now, father, for I have received 5,000 guineas to stage Emma in London. London? Bah! There's no such place. But what of Sister Anne? <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte, why, sister, what means this jiffy bag full of syringes and opium? <laughs> what, this? Why, it's tit. I found them in a skip. <laughs> but enough of me. I have news of a profitable investment. Listen, right, all I need from you is ten guineas. Ten guineas? Five thousand. I got a hot tip this time and no mistake. Five thousand guineas to invest in a scheme to build a huge cheese scone nine miles wide. <laughs> Excellent idea. Just what we need to soak up the sea. It's getting nearer, you know. <laughs> Surely such a cheese scone will be eaten by sea mice. Brother Bramwell, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard these men of cheese are looking for female companions. There. The mighty scone is baked. Sister, this scone seems naught but three inches wide. To you, maybe. We're thoracic. We shall never get out of this place. I'll write another book. And yes, I will call it Thunderball. <laughs> like most people who wash with food products, I have spent much of my life living alone. <laughs> living alone is one of those things that sometimes people say they'd like to do, but really they know it's rubbish, like going to the theatre. Now, some people deliberately live on their own. Hermits, the only religious folk named after a kind of little crab, they live on their own. 
They have to as they go round in filthy pampers and have beers like a grizzled old chimp's bum. Some saints used to live alone, like St. Francis of Assisi, who, if memory serves me right, was a kind of human airport for sparrows. And all lighthouse keepers live alone, probably because the stairs are so narrow and they spend all their time stuck on the staircase going, Get out of my way, there's a ship coming, I need to change the huge light bulb. But the problem with living alone is you tend not to live in a lovely glass palace in sex land, drinking white wine from glasses that look like dragon condoms with bases on them. You tend to live in tiny rooms where the carpets don't meet the walls, and the boiler is so dodgy that every time the hot water comes on you pass out for a couple of minutes. I once lived in a bedsit that was so small that I could make a cup of tea, make some toast, and watch Network 7, all without getting out of bed. It was like living in the Jetsons, only with a bag of dirty laundry the size of a dinosaur's nadger next to the bed. <laughs> living in a whole house full of bedsits is like being in a jail for the lonely. <laughs> and what's this one in for, Warder? Does his laundry once a month and has a high, keening laugh that makes girls frightened, sir? <laughs> no. The only difference between living on your own and being in jail is that most people living in bedsits would probably welcome the odd rogering from a Puerto Rican serial killer. <laughs> Quick! Here comes Lord Bouncy, the inflatable aristocrat! <laughs> Hello, children! Hello, Lord Bouncy! This week, Lord Bouncy is in residence at Bouncy Castle. Out taking the air one morning, the ventilated Viscount bumped into an old flame. It was his cousin, Lady Inflatementia of Tring! Lady Inflatementia and Lord Bouncy had been courting when Lady Inflatementia joined an expedition to climb Mount Huge in Tibet and got wedged in a crevasse for ten years. <laughs> Lord Bouncy had given up all hope of ever seeing her again until this week. He asked her to marry him, but it was not to be, for as he picked her a rose... <laughs> Tragedy stuck the gaseous gentlefolk again. Aww. Aww. One cheer for Lord Bouncy. <laughs> Next on Radio 2, after a concert by some band who used to get played on Radio 1, but are now slightly too old, it's the Old Spaniel. Last week, the old spaniel entered a drinking contest against some Alsatians from the council estate and won, but got done over in the car park after. The old spaniel. Yep, 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 yep. Wake up, wake up. Oh, my bloody head. Jesus Christ, I'm dying. <laughs> Morning, dogs. Hello, you're nice. Give me dog sweets. Oh, dear. Someone looks grumpy this morning. Kill me. Throw me into the pond. I want to die. Oh no, a dry heave. Come on, onto the lawn and meet the other dogs. New dogs, new dogs come to stay. They'll be my friends. I'll shag them. Oh, come on, you fine young bitches. Hello, hello, we're puppies. Hello, hello, I've wet myself. Oh God, puppies. Why are you so fat? Why? Why? Can I chew your leg? Yes, chew his leg. Chew his leg. Thank you. Thank you. Ugh, it tastes of curry. Let me try. Ugh. Get off me, you little bastards. I'll rip your throats out. You won't. You've got no teeth. Why's he got no teeth? Why's he got no teeth? Syphilis. Ugh. Why do you smell of beer and whittle? Get away from me! <laughs> you made them cry, you pisshead doggy. Are you happy now, big man doggy? He can make puppies cry. <laughs> he made me do my business. And me, a big business on the ground. What's going on here? Oh my God, it looks like a dirty protest. <laughs> That's it. Where's my gun? <laughs> oh. Jane? What? That's quite...
Quite an unusual moustache you have there. Thanks, fatty. It's an eyebrow. I was on the sunbed too long and the whole left side of my face melted. Ah, sexy. And now, part 12 of the Ike Turner and Melvin Bragg story. I, Melvin. The Lovely Milkmaid by Melvin Bragg. M. Bragg. Mr. Melvin Bragg Esquire writ this book. (laughs) Me. Chapter 1. The wind blew her slimpy blouse... skimpy blouse open. Her older yet still sterile lover... virile lover smiled. (laughs) Hello, he said, and welcome to the South Bank Show. There you are, spritzer boy. What's that book? You keeping a diary of your sexual infidelities? Give it to Ike! Yo, Ike! Yo, 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 yo. Who's this bitch on page 41? She your hoe? No, Ike. She's a fictional character. Oh, yeah? Well, fiction this! <laughs> I am very hoppy. Oh, happy. We don't need another hero. Shut your fat hole, Waterstones boy! <laughs> well, that's all from Bussman and Qu- Oh, no. Miss, force your thumb into me here. Frappens. Buff up me happy lamp, sir. Put a shine on it. No. Blow into me navel with a straw really old. <laughs> Shave my hairless arms and oil them. Only a guinea. Get out. Hold me thing. Out. Well, that's it from Busman and Quantic, King Size. Darling, where are you going? Back to my mother. But what about us? What about the kids? What about the love we had together in the living years? That's all. Good night. Live from the <laughs> snazzy Imperial Rooms Mayfair, that was Busman and Quantic King Size. Written by and starring Jane Busman and David Quantic, with Duke Peter Serafinowicz, Lady Rachel Atkins, and Count Steve Brody. Additional material by Mike Kehoe and Steve Brody. The producer now, forever and always, was Phil Bauka. <laughs> Miss, make the back arch. No.